God is good. And all the time, even in the bad times, God is good. I've got this message I want to share for you. It's called A Brand Plucked from the Burning. Now, this message was had to do in our Bible school. With the pastors, we have a Bible school. And uh, as, as we're, I'm teaching uh, this particular term, this is the final term, on church history. In fact, it's great because uh, it's about John Wesley and uh, sharing on this particular area. And I said, wow, I was so motivated by the area. I said, I think I might preach it, okay? I'm trying to get it from teaching to preaching. It's a bit of an art. So I love Melissa today. She came to me um, before the service in the 9.30. She says, you know, my assignment is due th- this next week. She says, it's on John Wesley. But I think I'll listen to your preaching to make sure it all lines up coming out here. But I'm sure it's perfect, sister. I'm sure it is. Praise God. There's an excerpt that's proclaimed to be from John Wesley's diary. And it says, Sunday, May the 5th, AM. I preached in St. Anne's and was asked not to come back. That's a great welcome, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, Rodney. You preached, don't come back. Now, that would be terrible, right? <laughs> May the 5th, Sunday p.m., I preached at St. John's. The deacon said, get out and stay out. <laughs> May the 12th, Sunday a.m., preached at St. Jude's. Well, I can't go back there either. P.m., Sunday, May the 12th, preached at St. George's. Oh, I was kicked out again. May the 19th, Sunday a.m., preached at St. Somebody Else's, I meaning he couldn't remember the name. The deacons called a special meeting and said I couldn't return. <laughs> Sunday p.m., May the 19th, preached on the street. They kicked me off the street. How do you kick someone off the street? But they kicked them off the street. Sunday a.m., May 26th, preached out in the meadow. Somebody opened up the gate and let the bull loose during the service. We all had to run. June the 2nd, Sunday a.m., preached at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June the 2nd, afternoon service, preached in a pasture and 10,000 people came out. Now, that in itself sounds good, but let me tell you what's wrong with Google, in case you're a Google Google or Googleite or whatever you call yourself. Google is not reliable and Google's not right. And as beautiful as that sounds, it's not actually correct. This is actually from the diary because I have copies of the material, okay? So it's a little bit different. It all sounds like it's week after week. This is actually how it's really gone, okay? In the year of 1738, May the 7th, Sunday a.m., priest in St. Lawrence's was asked not to come back. 1738, Sunday p.m., May the 7th, priest at St. Catherine Crees Church, deacon said, get out, stay out. In the year of 1738, morning of May the 14th, preach at St. Anne's, can't go back there either. May the 21st, in the year of 1738, in Sunday afternoon, preach at St. John's, kicked out again. In the evening of May the 21st, preach at somebody else's, Bennett's maybe, deacons called a special meeting and said I couldn't return. But now we jump a year. In the year now of 1739, not back to back, in the year 1739, a year later, Tuesday, May the 8th, it was an afternoon service. I preached in a pasture in Bath. 1,000 people came to hear me. In September of that year of 1739, it was a Sunday. I preached to 10,000 people three weeks in a row in the Moorfields. Jump forward to 1742, Friday, March the 10th. I preached in the meadow, was chased out of the meadow as a bull was let loose during the service. What makes that even more special is a simple idea is that it wasn't week to week, week to week, and you think that after five weeks of persistency, you get your breakthrough. But even after three years, you still got a bull chasing you out of the field. (laughs) Even though you preach to 10,000 people over three weeks, someone still lets out the rotten bull to wreck your meetings. So the key word here is persistency. Persistency. The problem with us as Christians is that because we have a setback or two, we give up. We had a setback in the relationship. We had a setback in, in, in ministry. We had a setback in this or a setback in that or, or blah, 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 blah. So we give up. See, the difference between someone who makes history to those who live in history is that they don't give up. It's the challenges and the trials that make us. It's the challenges and the obstacles 
that make us. In the early decades of the 18th century, for those who are unfamiliar with those terms, 1700s, England was a terrible place. Can you put that first image up? It was decadent. In fact, if you look up history, it was the most vilest place you could think there was. Prostitution was the number one employment for women. Alcoholism was a disease. They said that the English parliament, 90% were drunk the entire time. Gin. Disease. Sexual transmitted diseases. Children dying on the street. It was a disastrous time. But who would think that in a time like this, that God could do something? In your most most darkest moment, when you think that God can't move, God can move. There's a whole sermon here about advancing his kingdom, but I'll try and hold that to another time. The established church was the Anglican church. And the Anglican church was all about being a moderate. Everything was moderate. We don't need to tell people they're sinners. We don't need to tell people uh, that they'll go to hell. Just let it be. Voltaire, who was a philosopher, not a Christian, Voltaire, who was into enlightenment, meaning he believed science over faith, said a church service in England is solid but mostly dry. He said the preacher just reads to the people. There's no gesture. There's no exaltation of the voice. He just reads. You know you're in a bad way when the world says church is boring. You know you're in a bad way when you're putting the world to sleep. (laughs) Many occasions where people have said to me over the years, not recently, you're too loud, you're too excitable, you're, you're too lively. What do you want, the Anglican? Ministers ignored the traditional Christian doctrine of repentance. So people approach God with, sure, a gentle reverence, but a cheerfulness like, she'll be right. In 1738, the Bishop Berkeley of the Church of England said that religion and morality in Britain had collapsed. The faith had collapsed and morality had collapsed. He said in his own words, to such a degree that was never before known in any Christian country. And into this world was born what I call an unlikely candidate. It was long ago and far away that a little five-year-old boy hung on the edge of life from a second story parsonage, which is on fire. You can put that picture up. When John Wesley was only five, his father, who is a minister, the house caught on fire. You know what made it worse? His parishioners put it on fire. And young Wesley himself should have died. His mother said he was plucked from the fire for some great purpose. In fact, the text that she draws to is found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, verse 2. And of course, she's reading from the King James, so I'll do that. It says, Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, when you read Zechariah chapter three, it's quite interesting because it's talking about Joshua, the priest, and it's talking about not Joshua in in the book of uh, Genesis, okay, uh, yep, but we're talking about Joshua, the priest. And it's talking about how Satan was standing before God. This is what Zechariah three says, because the word Satan means accuser. And he's standing before God saying, Joshua, the priest, is not qualified. And the Lord says, to you, you say he's not qualified, but he is a brand that I plucked from the fire. So anoint him to be my priest. You see, it's not what the world says. It's not what the devil says. It's what you believe. If you believe you're useless, then you'll have it. 
If you believe you have no future, then you'll have it. If you believe that your life's not worth anything, then that's exactly what you have. But we have got to change the direction of this world. And this mother, this Susanna Wesley, is one of the most incredible mothers I've ever read about or, or studied. Amen. Wesley was born in 1703 and died in 1791. And his mother, Susanna Wesley, was the daughter of a pastor. So she was a preacher's kid. But her father was kicked out of the Church of England because she was, her father was what they call a nonconformist. In other words, it was like, why do we have to be so religious? Let's be open to the Spirit as the Puritans were moving. So he was kicked out. So she married John Wesley's husband. And John Wesley's husband was just, I mean, he was a, a minister of the, of the Church of England, but my goodness, this guy's life was just so, so different. His name was Samuel and he was an Anglican priest and he was a preacher in this congregation that wouldn't pay his wages. But it got worse. Because it wouldn't pay his wages, he couldn't afford to pay the rent or electricity on the parish house. So they sent him to debtor's jail. They sent the pastor to jail, the congregation. He had to write to the bishop to override, to let him get out of jail. Could you imagine the sort of background that, that John Wesley was born into? Could you imagine the background that his wife, Susanna Wesley, was into? She saw the injustices towards her father and she saw the injustices towards her husband. And people quit church or give up church for the silliest little thing. But again, I could see that the persistency that's found in John Wesley was something he caught from his mother. John was one of 19 children, all natural childbirth, of course. Only 10 survived. There are three boys and seven girls. The other nine died from miscarriage or were stillborn. But she was an incredible woman. She was a phenomenal woman. She made sure that every one of those 10 children had an hour of her time every week. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. You complain perhaps that you don't have time for quiet time, but Susanna was phenomenal. All the kids knew that when she sat at the kitchen table and had the tea towel over her head, that means mom was talking to God and nobody disturbs her. I laugh sometimes at the background of the way things are. Of those 10 children, three were boys that survived and all three served the Lord. Of the daughters, all seven, all of them went to through horrendous hardship. One would die in childbirth. Another one of the daughters had five stillborn children. Another one married an alcoholic who would beat her and go on. It's just horrendous about what happened. John Wesley wanted to follow on the steps of his father and grandfather. He felt the call of God. He felt as his mother reminded him that he'd been saved for a reason. You know what's confusing? I say, this is confusing. A termite in a yo-yo. See, a lot of you don't understand it because you're too young, okay? But in my days, yo-yos were wood, timber. Any remember that? Okay. And a termite eats wood. So the irony is how confusing it must be for a termite that's in the middle of a yo-yo trying to eat its way out because it's spinning around and around and around. Maybe you'll get it. But the irony of this is John Wesley wants to experience God. He wants to serve God. He feels God's hand on him. He joins the established church, the Church of England. He becomes a missionary. You know what the irony is? He's not even born again. I was a Methodist. I was a confirmed Methodist. Right where the Logan Hospital is, is where our little Methodist church was. It was over 100 years old. The German settlers built it there. I loved God. I felt God. I, I, I wanted God, but I wasn't born again. I didn't know the Lord. 
John Wesley went to be a missionary in Georgia, in the United States of America, to the American Indians. Except when he went there, he found that the American Indians didn't want a bar of him. When he went there, he fell in love with the chief magistrate's daughter. But the chief magistrate's daughter fell in love with somebody else and left John out. So John, as the minister, did, I suppose, what any young, broken-hearted minister would do. He excommunicated her. <laughs> Let's just say he had to go quickly and get out of Georgia because he was about to be arrested by the chief magistrate. His ability with women was a disaster. When he did get married, he so neglected her because of the ministry and she so wanted his attention that as she found out where he was preaching, she'd go to the back of the church and yell at him and scream at him to be a husband. And when he wouldn't listen one time, she even came up to the front of the church and grabbed him by his long head and dragged him out of the church. No wonder the apostle Paul says, women, please be quiet in church, okay? I'm just kidding, just kidding. Don't take it serious. Can you put the image up of the ship? It was when Wesley was going to Georgia to be this great missionary that he met families called the Moravians. There was a great storm that happened. Can you put the next image up? And in this storm, when Wesley, his brother John, and others, were, so his brother Charles, were worried about their life, he saw these Moravians. Now, the Moravians are what we call Puritans. And the Puritans came this area from Germany, and they'd broken free from religious persecution, and they would preach Jesus in the purest form. And as they were going to the Americas as settlers to start a new life, there's a storm hit there, John and his brother Charles were petrified for their life, but these Moravians of children were just worshiping God. And John spoke to them and he said to them, how is it that you are not ordained ministers? And me and my brother, we are ordained ministers, but you have this peace and we are petrified. And they said to him, why should we worry about death? For if we die, we know we will be with God. <laughs> Why should we be fearful what happens? Now, even though John at this point in time didn't receive the Lord and he went on to be a missionary, which failed and he came back, it was those words that got him. Back in England, he would go to the meetings of the Moravians to really understand what it is to know God in a very real way. And it was in these meetings, as he came back as a failed missionary, that he bent his knee and received Christ and the power of God's Holy Spirit. It was said of John Wesley at that time that this was the faith that launched this fearless five foot two giant against an entire country ridden with the decay of hell. And the question I ask is how could one man make so large a difference? his message would be preached outside the church because the organized church forbade him. Door after door was shut on his face. In fact, I found it humorous that on June the 16th in the year of 1742, John Wesley went to Lincolnshire, Epworth and Lincolnshire to the church that his father used to pastor. And he had contacted the minister and said, can I do a service with you because this was my dad's church? The pastor said, no, you're too energetic for us. Your voice has too many variables. No, you're not welcome. So he stood outside the church and to his amazement, the church was packed because they all thought that John was gonna share in his father's church. So he said, what do I do when so many people have come to hear me speak, but I'm not allowed to enter the very church my father was out? Then he says, I know. You do the next slide, the grave. He said, we own the plot where my father is buried and it's right there at the door of the church. They can't stop me from standing on my dad's grave because we own that plot of land. 
And so he stood on the grave of his father and he preached. Well, how many know the church was completely emptied and all went outside and they all came to hear this man preach the word of God? It was a turbulent time. During John Wesley's time, there'd be the American Civil War. Conservatively, 24,000 English soldiers would die. How could God move in the land that seemed so bloodthirsty, that seemed so disconcerning? How could God move in the land that seemed so disconnected? If you look to the outside things, it can be easy to be discouraged. And if we look today at the outside things, we get discouraged. But when we look for God, we find peace. Teva. When we come into the ark, when we come into the word, John Wesley would write over 400 books. One of those books would be a dictionary, an encyclopedia. Another would be a medical journal, a medical book. Would you believe that? Over 400 books. He rode in his lifetime over 250,000 miles. In kilometers, that's 402,000 kilometers on the back of a horse. It is said that the horse knew the track so well that he just jumped on the horse, let go of the reins, and the horse knew exactly where to go while he studied and rode. When I was looking at his life, I was thinking about five important things. Number one, don't allow the hardships of your upbringing to make you bitter. Wesley could have looked at the hardships of his upbringing. His father was a very hard man, but he chose not to. Number two, don't allow the foolishness of your learning period to stop you from moving forward. Wesley could have said, I'm a failure as a missionary. I can't go on. Don't allow your failures to stop you. Number three, don't become bitter or unforgiving because of your peers. John Wesley was beaten, arrested, thrown around, but he held true to his convictions and truth. Number four, don't believe that the sins of the day are that bad and that heavy that they're more powerful than the God that you serve. Don't think that the time is so bad that we can't rise up. And number five, don't allow your mistakes to stop you from serving Him. His marriage, His walk. Can musicians come up? John Wesley wrote in his journal, he was 88, his 80s, and he said, God, forgive me. Today, I could only spend an hour, hour and a half in prayer on my knees rather than two to four hours. In the home of John Wesley, which is kept as a special place for people to view, you can go upstairs to his room and they got the, it's rubbed off, and you can see where he'd pray so often, so much on timber floors that he actually worn grooves in the floor from his knees. It was back quite a few years ago many, many decades ago, where there was an American Bible school tour going in through the area. And they're talking about this move that happened to go there. And they all went through the house of John Wesley and they're looking at all the things. And when they went back to the bus to leave, they were counting the students. And they were missing one of the American Bible students. He was a lanky, lanky sort of farmer boy, but hungry for God. And they're looking for him everywhere. And it says, has anybody seen him? Has anybody seen him? Anybody seen him? Nobody could see him. And so they're in a panic mode saying, where has he wandered off to? This is not like him. Where's he gone? What's happening? And they're looking everywhere. And as they're in the house of Wesley, because it's closed up, they heard this noise. So they began walking up the stairs, you know, those creaky stairs towards the bedroom. And they found that this young American lanky Bible student had stepped over the boundary ropes, walked up and placed his knees in the grooves of Wesley 
and was collapsed over the bed of John Wesley. And he was sobbing and he was saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. The guide of the Bible school tapped him and said, Billy, Billy Graham, as you know, him, Billy, it's time to go. Do it again. Do it again. God can do it again and again and again and again. It's like an old song, isn't it, right? He can do it again. Remember that old song? You don't remember it? All right. Ross, I'm looking at you. He can do it again. Remember? You're not that young, okay? God can do it again. Can we stand together? I want God to do it again. Right now, we live in a time where there's uncertainty. We hear of wars and rumours of wars. That's nothing new. From the day that Jesus died on the cross, it was the beginning of wars and rumours of wars. It doesn't just happen in your time. It's always here. There's wars, there's rumours of wars, there's violence, there's injustices. Babies' heads chopped off. Young girls raped and thrown naked in the back of a ute and paraded around the areas. The injustice of it all. Bombs killing and slaughtering thousands upon thousands, the injustice of mankind. Our own nation gets divided over a vote on who is or isn't. There's pain in our land. There's pain in our people. But if we want God to do it again, it starts with us. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, Lord, cleanse me first. And the Lord touched him with the seraphim. And then the Lord said, whom shall I send? He said, here am I, Lord, send Danny. <laughs> no, they, they didn't say that, Lord. Here am I, Lord, send Jake. No. It was, here my Lord, send me. You could be standing here and I said, well, I hope that the person he's trying to preach to is listening. <laughs> I'm preaching to you. Because God wants a firebrand. He wants to pluck a firebrand out of the fire. <laughs> and He wants to brand that old devil right on that, well, you know, schmuck. It's not your gender. It's not your culture. It's not your ethnicity. It's not your economics. It's not your education. It's just like, here, my Lord. Send me.